Good afternoon, everyone. And um, as always, a very happy Thursday to all of you, no matter where you're watching us or joining us from today. Um, it's great to be talking to you all. Um, it's quite a grey and uh, miserable day here in Tottenham. Um, so um, it's nice to take a lunch break out and just um, talk to everyone about churches. Um, as is always the case, um, with these lectures, the first 10 minutes we dedicate to something which we call Church of the Week, which is where we explore um, a church in our care at the Church Conservation Trust. We have 356 churches in our care at the moment. Um, and one of those churches that we explore each week, which in some way has a link to um, today's topic of the lecture. Now, normally I pass you over to our Chief Executive, Peter Rez, but he's in a really important meeting. I'm pleased to tell everyone um, he's recovered from COVID. Um, last week he couldn't make us because he was quite poorly, um, but I'm really pleased to say that um, He's feeling much better and is now um, safely working from home. Um, so um, without any further delay, I'm going to pass you over to um, the person who's doing this week's um, Church of the Week, which is Shana James. Thank you, George. Thank you for that introduction. And I'm now going to share my screen with you so I can tell you about today's Church of the Week. And George will give me the thumbs up and tell me if I shared my screen correctly. Thank you, George. So, um, First of all, I want to thank Ecclesiastical Insurance for sponsoring Church of the Week. And I'm very pleased to tell you that today's Church of the Week is Holy Trinity Wensley in North Yorkshire. Holy Trinity was built in the 1240s during the reign of Henry III, and the South Chancel survives almost intact from that period. Subsequent waves of remodelling occurred during the medieval period of that, um, with that of the nave, aisles and north porch taking place in the 14th century. Now there's lots of interesting treasures in this church and this one's quite unusual. Um, this is a reliquary which can be found in the North Isle and is a container for either the bones of a saint or objects associated with them or other holy items. This reliquary is believed to come from the White Canons Abbey of St Agatha at Easeby nearby, which was established in the Anglo-Saxon period and dissolved by Henry VIII. Now in slide two, we see inside the nave of the church and here we've got um, a hexagonal sandstone font, which bears the names of two church wardens and the rector, George Scott. It dates, as you can see, from 1662. And the guidebook tells me this beautiful carved wooden font cover was found, was re actually rediscovered in 1928 under a pile of rubble in the tower, which is often the case with churches. Things get a misplaced, sometimes fonts even get used as bird baths in people's gardens or things found in nearby farmers' fields. And here you can see um, in the South Isle, in the sanctuary, we have some Gothic stone sedilla seats. And these are located in the sanctuary. They're intended for the officiating clergy and are often a feature of medieval churches. They're in the early English style with dog tooth mouldings and I think are a particularly fine example. Another lovely feature of this church are the oak chancel pews. These date from 1527 and were carved by a particularly fine school of craftsmen known as the Ripon Carvers, whose work appears in Ripon Cathedral. These poppy head bench ends are decorated, as you can see here, with heraldic um, symbols and animals. Now, I think I've saved the last, the best part for last. Um, and you can see here some surviving paintings which are on the north wall of the nave and you can see the legs of these figures have been uncovered. They date from the 14th century and depict the three, three dead individuals whose corrupt bodies are being eaten by worms. So those bits coming off you can see there are, are worms. And as you can see the only remaining part is the legs so you can see where it's been uncovered under the plaster work there of the nave. And here's um, a close up feature of one of the figures. I'm not quite sure who that little creature is, whether that's legs or someone's head peeping, peeping underneath. But you can see how beautifully it's been painted and um, you can really tell there the, the worms. It's very, very gory. Um, but the three living and three dead was quite a well-known story of the period. Um, and it has to win the award for the most evocative yet does what it says on the tin title for any trope of literature or art known to man. I think. Um, it's essentially a cautionary tale and an effective memento mori, a reminder that death comes to all. The story itself is simple though grotesque. Three young noblemen are out hunting in a forest when they suddenly encounter three corpse counterparts in various horrifying stages of decomposition, but all very much walking and talking. Understandably shocked at this sight, 
the noblemen hesitate between fleeing and facing down the dead and becoming even more terrified when these cadavers launch into a tirade, advising them to check their behaviour and curb their greed and act with humility and piety or suffer for it in the afterlife. So the crux of this message was, we were you, and if you don't change your ways before it's too late, you will be us. The origins of this story are shrouded in mystery, but it may well have originated in France. Whatever the origin, it became hugely popular. There are countless tellings of this tale in various formats throughout England and France, dating back at least to 1280, as well as known examples in Scandinavia and Switzerland. Whilst the earliest known example of the story is a poem, it was clearly a story that could be well told through visuals and it became a common feature in church art. So I'll leave you with that. But George, you, you know that I often try and um, bring things back to, to one of my favourite <laughs> favorite film um, series, Harry Potter. And this reminds me, those of you that know, um, the Deathly Hallows in Harry Potter. So I don't know if you agree with that, George, or is that just wishful thinking on my part? Um, but I'll, I'll leave you with that, that, that gory picture of the worms there. And um, everyone, that's, that's Church of the Week. Back over to you, George. Thank you so much, Shana, for that. Um, that was really interesting. And um, yeah, I think I do agree um, that that was, um, there is a link there with the Deathry Hallows. Might be a bit tenuous, but I think we can, we can still claim there's a link there. Um, so thank you, Shana. And everyone, that was Church of the Week, which as Shana said, that was the Church of Wensley in North Yorkshire. Um, so normally we have time for a few questions. So I'm going to chuck in um, Shana. I'm going to chuck her in the deep end because we've not done any prep today for any <laughs> questions. So um, Shana, obviously we've got the free living and the free dead. Um, can you think of any other spooky or uh, slightly creepy or macabre things in our care at the Church's Conservation Trust? Oh, blimey, you're throwing me at the deep end there, George. We didn't practice this. Um, I think, you know, the um, depiction, again, wall paintings, the, the, the doom. I mean, that must have been quite scary. We've got the jaws of hell on various doom paintings in our churches. And, you know, it's this big creature with teeth and bodies hanging out. Um, I mean, that, that to me is, is quite creepy. But I've seen quite a few. I've taken my children around churchyards and we do have some 18th century um, tombstones outside which have, schools on them and they say oh are they pirates mummy I say no that's you know that's quite quite a common feature because they don't always survive but often inside the churches you have the effigies which sometimes are quite creepy especially when they're picked out with you know they're painted some of the Tudor effigies and monuments and sometimes you have the children holding the skulls um, I can't think of one in particular but they they can be quite sort of eerily lifelike as well especially when they've got the skulls. I think so. And uh, what you just said there about the jaws of hell, I think is really interesting because obviously it ties into this whole idea of medieval prayers to the dead and um, purgatory, hell. Um, and obviously a lot of them were destroyed during the Reformation. So it's a really important that we've still got some in our care at the CCT. Um, a really great example, I believe, is at the Church of St. Lawrence's in Broughton, which I don't, you know, you, you've been there, Shana, we did it on Thiebra Chase, but it, it really is a spectacular church. It's probably, I don't know if you'd agree, but I think it's our best church in terms of um, medieval wall paintings well yes I mean we can't have favorites but I do really like that one it's, it's got a particularly nice depiction of Saint George and the dragon um, but I mean going back to depictions of the dead I think medieval people had a, a far more healthy um, view of things because you know they're saying they're confronting death and they're saying the, the, the three dead in, in this story saying what we are you will become and I think that's something that we're kind of we're not as close to these days no, I think you're absolutely right there. But um, everyone, we are going to be doing a lot more stuff around death. Um, you'll be pleased to, well, maybe not pleased to know, but um, we've got some really interesting lectures lined up for you. Um, I've been planning a next year, next year's series and um, I've got some really great talks for you. But also we're, as I, I keep, I feel like I'm teasing everyone because I keep saying there is an announcement in the works. There is an announcement in the works. Shana's in on it. She knows what's going to be coming. Um, but Shana, I think people are going to be really excited about what we'll be announcing in a few weeks, won't they? Yes, it's some some nice extra content for people that uh, uh, we think that we think they will enjoy. So we'll leave that little another little teaser for you there. Um, but everyone, that was Church of the Week, and as we said, that was Wensley um, in um, North Yorkshire. Um, so everyone, welcome to today's lecture. Um, if you're joining us for the first time, please do um, comment away on Facebook, or if you're catching up on YouTube or on one of our other platforms, please do comment away and let us know where you're watching 
from, where you're watching us from, and also do let us know if it's your first time. But to all of our returning um, guests and visitors, um, thanks so much for joining us again. I've really enjoyed seeing some of the comments. I've seen someone said they've got a homemade apple waffle and some hot coffee. Um, I'm quite jealous because I had to make do with just baked potatoes and some baked beans for lunch. So um, I think some people got a better menu than I've had today. Um, but everyone, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, as is always the case, these lectures are completely free of charge. So if you see anybody commenting away and um, telling you you can watch, um, watch our lectures elsewhere and um, please do not click those links you can only watch them live currently on our Facebook page and um, we are working on some other things which hopefully open up where we can stream to um, but our lectures are always recorded and they're always available to watch free of charge um, there is a link in our Facebook um, description to watch them on Facebook but you can catch them up on YouTube as well um, now, um, if you are enjoying these lectures, um, please do consider supporting our work. There's a few ways that you can do that. You can text donate, so you can text CCT to 70331, and that will give us a gift of three pounds. Um, alternatively, you can donate any amount that you wish um, through our website, which is www.visitchurches.org.uk. Or finally, you could be one of the many people who have joined us as a member. And now being a member is really um, a great way to support our work, but it's a way that we are enormously grateful for people supporting us for, because it allows us to um, plan better. Um, we can sort of, uh, we know what's gonna be coming in in some ways financially, because we know how many members we've got. But membership starts from just £3.50 a month. It, it's not that much, it's the price of coffee a month. Um, but in return, you get some really great benefits. So you get a fantastic members um, magazine, which is called Pinnacle. And you get that a few times a year. And that was actually picked up in The Times just a few weeks ago. Um, and there was an article about it. You get invites to exclusive events and um, uh, lectures. Um, we've got an exclusive member lecture series that started a few months ago that you'll be able to access. But as well as that, you get to hear up to date um, information from us at the Trust and hear what's going on behind the scenes. But also, if you join us by direct debit, um, as I said, from just £3.50 a month, if you join us by direct debit and use the offer code LECTURE, and that's LECTURE in capitals, um, you'll get a free copy of this book, which is The Secret Language of Churches and Cathedrals. And this was written by a previous lunchtime lecturer of ours, Dr Richard Stemp, and I'm really pleased that he's coming back in a few weeks to do a follow-up lecture. But this book is a phenomenal it's a beautiful book. It's got beautiful photography in it. It's full of really interesting um, facts. It's quite easy to digest as well. It's not too um, not too academic, uh, but it's got some really great, as I said, graphics and images there. As I said, if you join us by direct debit and use the offer code lecture, you will get this book free of charge. Now, if you're already a lecture, uh, sorry, if you're already a member and would like to purchase this, you can purchase it through our website. Um, I'll post a link shortly where you can get that from. Now, we're really excited today because we're joined once again by David Casterton, who came, um, did a lecture for us earlier this year to celebrate a brand new book launch. Um, and it was this book he launched with us earlier this year. Now, there was so much in um, in this book that um, he wanted to talk about and um, he can talk about um, that we've invited him back and we're really delighted that he's agreed to come back and do a follow-up lecture, particularly in this season of um, Halloween, when we approach Halloween. So um, we're really looking forward to today's lecture, but you can buy this from us. Now, I must say, I've only got four copies left, but do not worry. I've ordered another batch. They've, they've actually sold out at the publishers. They're being reprinted. Um, I've placed a, I placed an order a few weeks ago. They should be delivered um, either tomorrow or early next week to me. So I'm hoping to post them out next week. But if you do order them, um, we will let you know when they're coming. But it should be in the next couple of weeks. But it is a great, um, great book. And um, this is my favourite bit. I was talking to David earlier because we haven't got many in England, but the bit about osseries. So, yes, that is... Um, that is today's book, which you can buy from us. Now, I've seen quite a few comments coming in just now asking about a certain um, uh, guest who's made an appearance the last few weeks. And the answer is, um, yes, he is a permanent fixture. Um, some of you will know that um, if you joined our lectures last year, I had two dogs. And very sadly, I lost my um, the eldest um, just before Christmas last year. And uh, Clement was quite lonely, um, as was I. So I um, got a new one. And um, yep, yeah, he's um, now 18 weeks old, Black Labrador. and. Um, a quick test for everyone. Um, he's not named after a Pope, after Clement is. Um, this one is named after England's first martyr. So um, for those of you who know up on your history, um, I'll leave it to you to try and guess his name. But um, yes, he will be um, joining us um, at the upcoming lectures, I'm pleased to say. And he has been to a CCT church, but that's enough from me anyway today. And I'm gonna pass you back to Shana, who's going to introduce and get today's lecture underway. You're starting him off young, aren't you? Taking him around to churches. 
Um, I like that test. I'd, I'd like to see in the chat who, how many people have, have guessed the correct saint's name. So tell us that again, George. It's the first. Um, it's the first um, uh, martyr of England. OK. Yeah, and I'll give a clue. There's a city named after the martyr. Oh, don't make it too easy. Um, OK. <laughs> Thanks. And I love the way you're sat, George, because it looks like you've got an extra long dog. It's to... <laughs> You can see the head at one end and then the feet at the other. It's like a giant sausage dog. But no, it is two dogs. And very, I've met both of them. Very lovely. Uh, they are too. So um, I think that's enough from George and I. Um, and George, you're going to post a link to David's book in the chat, aren't you? Um, so as we said, um, David Caston is the author of Church Curiosity, Strange Objects and Bizarre Legends. Um, we, he's always, some of you may have seen, seen his lecture um, when he joined us before. He's also a novelist and the winner of the 2019 Go Gothic Short Fiction Prize. On his popular blog, The Serpent's Pen, he explores the Gothic, the Gothic folklore, fake lore, and the obscure and quirky and the darker reaches of literature and the arts. So I'm really looking forward to this. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to David. Thank you. Hello, can you hear me? Yep, good. Okay, so uh, I'll just, my name is David Castleton, delighted to be here. Thank you for inviting me. I'll just put up my presentation. Okay, so um, today I'm going to be uh, talking about uh, British churches, creepy artifacts and spooky tales, a Halloween special. So with Halloween coming up, I thought I'd investigate um, some of the um, creepier artifacts and legends connected with our, our churches. So um, as um, has, uh, has been mentioned by George and Shana, uh, all of the um, things I'm going to talk about today can be found in my book, uh, Church Curiosities, Bizarre Objects, sorry, Strange Objects and Bizarre Legends, published by uh, Shire, which is a subsidiary of Bloomsbury. So if you like um, some of the strange um, things we're investigating today, there are plenty more in the book, which can be uh, purchased from the Church's Conservation Trust at a very reasonable price. So let's um, take a look at today's lecture outline. So first of all, we're going to be having a look at mummified hearts and ghostly monks. Then we'll be uh, saying something about a terrifying Halloween tradition in a Welsh churchyard. Then um, we're going to be investigating a haunted church in a Neolithic henge. Uh, ghostly drummers and pipers lost in eternal tunnels comes next. Then uh, we'll be thinking about the blazing black hellhounds of Suffolk and phantom dogs of Dartmoor. And finally, the ragged regiment, Westminster Abbey's spooky funeral effigies. So if we um, turn to the first uh, topic um, about um, preserved hearts and ghostly monks, in the picture, you can see uh, a church, which is St. Mary the Virgin's Church in Woodford, Northamptonshire. And in 1866, workmen were doing some renovation work on this church and they made a very strange discovery. They moved a, a beam which was uh, pressing against a pillar and they found a recess and uh, there was a little box in this recess and inside the box was a preserved mummified human heart. So um, obviously people were uh, very curious about this and they, they were wondering where this strange artifact might have come from and there are several different possible explanations for it. So some uh, people think that the heart might have belonged to a monk because a monk's ghost has been seen in uh, the church. So um, two ladies apparently uh, saw this ghost. One of them saw the monk kneeling at the altar, a bit like in this uh, photograph here. Another saw the ghostly monk walking down the aisle of the church and uh, disappearing when he reached uh, the place where the, uh, the heart had been found. Uh, this photograph, by the way, uh, this actually hangs in, uh, in the church in Woodford. And it was taken in 1964 by two teenagers who were on a cycling holiday. And they took the photo of uh, the inside of a church 
but they didn't actually notice this strange figure until the um, they were showing the snaps to some family members at Christmas, and then they noticed this weird, possibly monk-like figure here kneeling uh, before the the altar. So um, possibly the hat may have belonged to a, a monk whose ghost can still be seen in the church. There are, however, other possible explanations for the hat. Some people think the hat might have sat in the chest of a, a knight who was a crusader. And um, there's a legend that a knight from Woodford went over to the Holy Land on crusade where he was killed and his friends cut out his hat, preserved it and brought it back to, to Woodford where they uh, secretly entombed it in the, uh, the pillar in the church. And if we just go back and have a look at the, the photograph, um, this figure, it might be a monk, but it could possibly also be a knight because uh, we've got the um, sort of garment here, which might be a knight's surcoat possibly. And in the, the Crusades, there were um, organizations like the Knights Templars and the Knights Hospitallers who kind of combined the functions of being a monk with, with being a knight. So maybe, maybe the heart does belong to a crusader. Um, another theory is that the heart belonged to uh, the Lord of the Manor, um, a gentleman called Walter Traley, who died in, nine, in 1290. So here we can see uh, the wooden effigies of Walter and his wife, Eleanor, which can be found in the church. And if we look at how uh, Traley's effigy is dressed, he's wearing something which looks like a knight's surcoat. He's wearing some kind of a head covering and he's wearing a, a belt for his sword. And if we go back to the picture of a so-called ghost, we can see that he seems to have on some kind of surcoat, some kind of belt and some kind of head covering. So perhaps, perhaps a ghost in the heart are Walters. Another uh, theory is that the heart belonged to a local aristocrat called Roger de Kirkton. And uh, there's actually some documentary evidence to back up this theory because uh, the official papers of the Duke of um, um, Buckley state, in 1812, Roger de Kirkton, who married from the daughters of Lord Robert Mouth died and his body was buried in Norfolk where he died and his heart was buried in the church of Woodford or Wodeford. Um, so possibly um, this is referring to the heart which was found in the, the pillar in the church. So this is all um, a real mystery. And um, as for the, uh, the ghostly photo taken by the two young holiday makers, this did actually get into the, the press um, in the early 60s, and it was quite a big item in, uh, in the newspapers. And uh, the company which made the film, a company called Agfa, did actually investigate the, the photograph. And they found that um, the film hadn't been tampered with in any way. There were no um, problems with the, uh, the development of the photograph, no evidence of um, a double exposure or anything like that, no fault with the film. So uh, I don't know what the, the photograph captured, if it was a ghostly monk or knight or, or whatever, but uh, it's certainly quite a mysterious um, thing. Okay, so um, we're going to think now about uh, the uh, strange and terrifying tradition in a, a Welsh churchyard at, at Halloween. So this is uh, St. Diggins Church uh, near um, Langunru. Um, I do apologize for my terrible Welsh pronunciation, near Conwy in Wales. And there's a tradition that in this churchyard, every Halloween at night, uh, the voice of an angel booms out of the churchyard. It's uh, an angel called the uh, Angelistor or recording angel. And um, his announcement is especially terrifying because he lists the names of all the parishioners who are due to die in the forthcoming year. So according to legend, there was a, a man living in this parish who was very skeptical about this tradition. So uh, one Halloween night, he sneaked into a churchyard to see if he could hear the angel making his announcement. And um, sure enough, the announcement came, the booming voice of the angel resounded in the churchyard, uh, listing the names of the people who were going to die that year. And uh, the skeptical man was horrified to hear his own name amongst those uh, which were called out. And sure enough, he died during the next 12 months. So, um, it's interesting to think where this um, Halloween tradition might have come from. 
So Halloween is descended from Celtic festivals like the Irish uh, Samhain and the Welsh uh, Calon uh, Gaeaf, uh, again, sorry for my pronunciation. And these festivals were um, in a large part uh, festivals of the dead. There was the idea that uh, the time of Halloween marked the transition from the lighter, warmer part of the year towards the darker, colder part of the year. And Halloween was also a transition point between the worlds of the living and the worlds of the dead. So the tradition was that the film separating the realms of the dead from the realms of the living was very thin at this particular point in time. So um, souls of the dead could pass uh, back and forth more easily between our world and the, the other world, and so could more terrifying uh, spirits too. And uh, these traditions have lingered on in things like uh, All Souls Day and All Saints Day on the 1st and 2nd of November. Uh, and even in our modern Halloween, we have the idea that ghosts and spirits are, are abroad at, at this time. Um, these Celtic festivals were also times for divination as well. The idea that um, it was a time when it was easier to foresee the future. And uh, this can also be found in uh, Halloween traditions in, in later ages as well. So um, perhaps this, this idea of a, the angel calling out the, the names of the dead comes from the, the idea that um, the spirit world and our world were, were closer together at that time. And also this idea about foretelling the, the future at Halloween. Another uh, fact about St. Diggins Churchyard is that it's home to a very special uh, yew tree, this large uh, yew tree here. So um, this is the ancient um, Glangernry yew. Uh, it's estimated at between 1,500 and 5,000 years old. It's difficult to tell the age of yews because as they age, the, the center of the yew tends to get hollow and it tends to regenerate itself by putting out new, new roots, which then like continue growing as the, the yew tree as it spreads. Uh, but it's a very, very ancient yew and yews are, are very symbolic trees. So yews are evergreen and they have the ability to regenerate themselves, which represents eternal life. But also, as well as symbolizing life, yews also symbolize death. So their um, bark, berries and foliage are uh, fatally poisonous to humans and other animals as well. And also the, the wood of a yew is uh, used to be used for making longbows, which are an instrument of death. So, um, so it has this strange kind of duality representing both uh, life and, and death. Um, so these um, connotations uh, were probably known to pagans as well as Christians. And many uh, very ancient yew trees are actually older than the churches they're found near. And some think that um, especially old yews may be um, remnants or at least descendants of ancient sacred uh, groves, so like druidic uh, groves. So um, there might possibly be a tradition here as well with the yew linking to the, the tradition with the angel, you know, the idea that this tree symbolizes the um, uh, duality of life and death, and also possibly hinting that it might have been a, a pre-Christian religious site. So there are ancient yews which um, have evidence around them of being centers of uh, pre-Christian um, religious uh, worship. So um, we're next going to think about um, this, uh, this church here. So um, Knowlton, this is Knowlton Church in uh, Church Henge in, uh, in Dorset. So um, this is a ruined Norman church uh, from the 12th century, which is built in the center of uh, a Neolithic henge, which you can see in this photo. And the henge itself is in a, a center of a complex of uh, Neolithic and Bronze Age uh, earthworks, ditches, and barrows. So the henge was probably the center of an important uh, pre-Christian religious site. So uh, there are numerous um, spooky legends about this, uh, this ruined church here. So um, um, one, one legend is that it's haunted by a phantom horse and rider who apparently sometimes rides uh, straight through the church um, as if it isn't there. There's um, a legend of um, a, a face which can be seen uh, peering down from the church's tower of a weeping woman. Some say she's a nun who uh, can be seen uh, kneeling and praying outside the church. So um, no one knows what kind of sin she's trying to uh, get redemption for, but uh, whatever it is, it seems quite, uh, quite serious. 
people have reported um, kind of mists, strange mists around the church, chattering ethereal voices, and um, a, a, a figure dressed in black who gives out a very menacing kind of uh, aura. So we might wonder where uh, these legends, why so many of these ghostly legends have become attached to uh, this uh, church in Church Henge. And um, it does seem that um, ancient sites like stone circles, um, barrows, earthworks do tend to attract strange legends because for many years, people were curious about these sites, but they, they didn't understand them. They had very little understanding of who might have built these sites and why. And really we've only gained understanding of this sort of thing in the last uh, few decades. And e even today our understanding isn't perfect. So all kinds of strange um, legends have grown up around these sites. So for example, Stonehenge, um, there's a legend that the stones were transported from Ireland by either Merlin or the devil. Um, there are some stones called the uh, Royal Rite um, Stones in Oxfordshire, um, who are, which were rumoured to be a king and his men who were turned to stone by a witch. Another place in Oxfordshire called um, Wayland Smithy, um, which is the remains of a, um, a, a Neolithic barrow. And apparently if you go to Wayland Smithy and you leave your horse there and a coin, when you come back, you'll find that the horse has been shod by the uh, god Wayland, who was the Norse and Anglo-Saxon smith god. Um, also, things like barrows and uh, burial mounds uh, were often seen as being uh, entrances into the fairy realm as well. So uh, the, these ancient sites do, do tend to attract these kind of otherworldly um, legends. Okay, um, so this um, is Richmond Castle in North Yorkshire. And uh, there's a strange uh, ghostly legend attached to this castle about um, a young drummer boy. So um, there were um, rumours of a tunnel linking uh, Richmond Castle with a place called Easby Abbey, which is um, about one mile outside uh, Richmond in a hamlet called Easby, next to St Agatha's Church. And um, the soldiers at the castle, uh, they, uh, they discovered what appeared to be the mouth of a mysterious tunnel sometime in the late 1700s. And uh, they were wondering if this might be the, the rumoured tunnel which led out to Easby Abbey. So uh, what they decided to do was um, they, um, they thought the tunnel was very narrow, probably too narrow for um, adult humans to get down. So they um, talked to the regimental drummer boy and they persuaded, in inverted commas, the drummer boy to uh, walk along the tunnel. And uh, the plan was for the drummer to beat his drum and the soldiers would follow the, the patters of his drum from above and see where the tunnel would lead. So uh, in this photo, we can see uh, St. Agatha's Church with uh, Easby Abbey be behind it. So um, some say that the drummer boy was very brave and eagerly volunteered for the task. Others that he basically had to be forced into the tunnel. But um, according to the legend, he did go into the tunnel and start playing his drum and the soldiers followed from above. So they followed uh, the patters of the drum across Richmond Marketplace, which is just outside the castle. And then they followed it along the River Swale. And uh, it did seem to be leading out to, to Easby Abbey. But what happened was um, on the way, about half a mile before the abbey, the drumming suddenly stopped and no further sound was heard from the drum boy. Nobody knew what had happened to him, and uh, he was never seen again. Some people think that perhaps there was a cave-in in the tunnel that killed him. Others say perhaps some terrible subterranean monster grabbed him. Maybe he fell and banged his head, but um, no one ever saw or heard anything of him again. And about half a mile from Easby Abbey, there's this um, memorial stone, which allegedly marks the place where his drumming uh, ceased. And there's a, a plaque on the stone, which uh, we can see here, which says, according to legend, this stone marks the spot where the Richmond drummer boy reached in the tunnel, supposed to lead from Richmond Marketplace to Easby Abbey. Here the sound of his drumming ceased and he was never seen again. So this is an intriguing legend, but obviously there are some, um, some holes in it, uh, things that don't quite add up. So for example, nobody seems to know the drummer boy's name. He was apparently uh, famous and well-known enough to have a stone dedicated to him, but no one seems to remember his name. 
Also, we might ask um, if the soldiers really would have heard the patters of his drum from above the ground, especially as part of the route uh, leads alongside the River Swale, which is a very fast flowing and, uh, and quite noisy river. Also, there's absolutely no sign whatsoever of any tunnel mouths in uh, either Richmond Castle or in Easby Abbey. And um, if such a tunnel was discovered, it was probably a, a large uh, drain. But it's still, uh, still an intriguing legend and a nice one to tell near Halloween. There's um, a similar um, story in Edinburgh in Scotland. So um, in Edinburgh in Scotland, um, beneath the, the old town, there were rumoured to be many, many tunnels. I mean, there, there are many, many tunnels. And um, one uh, tunnel um, which um, had apparently been lost was a secret tunnel leading from Edinburgh Castle to um, Holyrood House Palace at the opposite end of the Royal Mile. And this tunnel uh, was rumoured to be for uh, monarchs to use uh, as an escape route if either uh, Edinburgh Castle or Holyrood House Palace were under siege. So several centuries ago, uh, some soldiers uh, apparently found a tunnel mouth in Edinburgh Castle, and they were wondering if this might be the um, entrance to the mysterious tunnel, which apparently led beneath the Royal Mile. Again, um, as in Richmond, um, the tunnel was rather narrow, so they found a young piper, bagpipe player, and they again persuaded him to uh, walk along the tunnel playing his bagpipes, and the soldiers would follow from above. So uh, the boy um, walked along the tunnel, the soldiers followed the sound of his bagpipes, and uh, they came to uh, a church on the Royal Mile known as Tron Church, and there the, the bagpipes um, abruptly stopped. So um, there were apparently rescue attempts, uh, but uh, they were unable to, to find the, the bagpiper, so the entrances to the tunnel were sealed up. So um, in Richmond, it's said that on uh, dark, quiet nights, you can still hear the ghostly patters of the little drummer boy coming from uh, the tunnels uh, below uh, the castle and the marketplace and on the way to Easby Abbey. And likewise in Scotland, in Edinburgh, uh, you're supposed to be able to hear sometimes on dark nights the ghostly sounds of bagpipes being played uh, beneath Edinburgh Castle and the Royal Mile and, uh, and Tron Church. Um, I don't know how much truth there is in these legends, but um, there may be nice ones, as I said, to, uh, to tell at Halloween. So um, other um, spooky British legends uh, concern phantom black dogs. So um, legends of these um, black dogs can be found all over Britain. And um, it's um, meant to be a, a large black dog with shaggy fur and uh, blazing red eyes, a bit like this, uh, this uh, drawing here. And this, this drawing is actually um, an artist's impression of a black dog, uh, one of Britain's most notorious black dogs found in East Anglia called um, Black Shook. So um, Black Shook is said to haunt uh, lonely lanes, lonely byways, isolated woods, uh, fields. And if you're out walking at night and you meet Black Shook, it really is bad news. Um, he may well attack you, he may kill you, or um, some people say he's just a very bad omen and that um, if you do see him, you'll die before uh, the year is out. So um, there's one legend connected with uh, Black Shook that says on the 4th of August 1577, he attacked Holy Trinity Church in Blytheborough in Suffolk. So um, it was a Sunday, the church was full of people worshipping, and um, Black Shook appeared, heralded by a terrible um, clap of thunder. Uh, the flaming hellhound sprinted down the church aisle and uh, in the process killed a man and a boy. And he also caused the tower of the church to um, collapse um, through the roof. Uh, the flaming dog then um, sprinted out of the church and uh, apparently he left scorch marks on the church's north door. And those scorch marks can still be seen today. On the same day, um, Black Shook attacked another church, uh, St. Mary's Church in Bungie in Suffolk. And um, this, uh, this attack was actually recorded in a pamphlet. So a pamphlet called um, A Strange and Terrible Wonder by Abraham Fleming, uh, which was published in 1577. 
And uh, this pamphlet says, this black dog of a devil passed between two persons as they were kneeling upon their knees and wrung the necks of them both at one instant clean backwards in so much that where they kneeled, they strangely died. There's also a, a poem about uh, Black Shook, which was uh, collected by uh, Enid Porter in Folklore of East Anglia in 1974. And uh, there's an extract from this poem here. Or down the church in the midst of fire, the hellish monster flew, and passing onward to the choir, he many people slew. So um, again, we might ask where this, this uh, legend of this strange incident comes from. So um, Abraham Fleming, who wrote this pamphlet, he was a London uh, writer and, and publisher. So he would have heard the accounts of uh, Black Shook uh, secondhand. So they were probably exaggerated uh, oral accounts, which he uh, put in his pamphlet. And also people think that the memories of this, this attack might be connected to um, memories of a particularly terrible thunderstorm and also the, the trauma of the Reformation. So England was going through the Reformation at that time. There were all kinds of religious and social uh, changes and upheavals. And some historians think that these traumatic memories express themselves via um, legends of supernatural creatures. So, for example, there's um, a village up in Cumbria called Croglin, which has a, a vampire legend. There's a legend of a vampire and a vampiric bat. And uh, these legends have actually been traced back to the time of the English Civil War, which, again, was a time of religious upheavals. And um, so people think they, they, these anxieties might have manifested themselves in this legend of a, an otherworldly creature. Another um, black dog legend can be found in the southwest of England in a village called Buckfastley, which is on the edge of Dartmoor. And uh, this legend is connected with a man called Richard Cabell, a local nobleman who died in 1677. And uh, Cabell, according to legend, was an extremely wicked man. Um, apparently, he sold his soul to the devil and he murdered his wife, um, Elizabeth. And when Cabell died, um, on the, the night of his burial, legend says uh, a pack of um, phantom black dogs came across ba uh, Dartmoor and they were howling and shrieking and they came into the churchyard at Buckfastley and they congregated around the, the tomb of uh, Richard Cabell making a terrible noise all night. And this, this went on for quite a long time. Um, uh, Cabell was said to be seen leading his pack of phantom black dogs across the moors in life, he'd, he'd loved hunting, and it was, seems to be something he continued in death. And um, especially on the anniversary of his death, he'd lead his phantom uh, hounds across the moors. And uh, when he wasn't um, out leading them across the moors, apparently the dogs would gather around his tomb and make a terrible racket with their unearthly howling and shrieking all night. So this greatly disturbed the local people, so they decided to deal with it by getting an especially um, heavy slab of stone and putting it over the grave of Richard Cabell. They also built this structure we can see here, this kind of mausoleum with barred windows around Cabell's grave as well, um, presumably to kind of keep the, the soul um, imprisoned there. And um, this um, seemed to work. And uh, the disturbances involving the ghost of Richard Cabell and the phantom black hounds uh, ceased. Um, it's said that this legend helped inspire Arthur Conan Doyle's book, The Hound of the Baskervilles. So um, a close friend of Conan Doyle was the young journalist uh, Bertram Fletcher Robinson, and he was from Dartmoor, and together they toured the area, making a, a note of the local legends. And it seems uh, Doyle was especially intrigued by this legend of, of Richard Cabell, and uh, it might well have uh, fed into his novel. Apparently, even to this day, there's a kind of um, sport among local teenagers where they uh, gather outside this mausoleum and they um, dare each other to stretch their arms through these bars to try to touch the, the tomb of Richard Cabell while hoping they won't be seized by his evil spirit. So this is a very colourful legend, but um, a little more investigation perhaps um, makes it a tiny bit less colourful. Um, so um, the mausoleum might actually um, have been built before Richard Cabell's death. It contains earlier graves than his. 
including a, a relative of his, also called Richard Cabell, who died in 1612. So uh, the mausoleum might have been built before Cabell's time. And uh, also, it seems he didn't murder his wife, Elizabeth, because his will makes mention of her. So Elizabeth was um, almost certainly alive when, uh, when Cabell died. If we think about the black dog legends more generally and where they, they might have come from, these legends are very common throughout the UK. They're common in other European countries and even in countries beyond Europe. So it seems a fairly universal archetype, the, the phantom black dog. Um, the black colour probably comes from the fact that black is um, seen as a um, colour of death and a mourning in uh, European cultures, in Western cultures. And as for the dogs, this might come from the dog's habit of uh, scavenging for carrion. Dogs can hunt, but they, um, they tend to prefer to scavenge and this kind of feasting on the corpses of dead animals probably linked dogs in the popular mind to, to death. So dogs uh, were seen as these kind of liminal creatures in, uh, in folklore. And uh, a lot of folklore has dogs haunting places like um, the sites of gibbets and gallows, um, burial mounds and uh, crossroads, these kind of liminal places where people tended to think the, the barrier between uh, the world of the living and the dead was, uh, was somewhat um, thin. Okay, so um, the next um, topic is the um, funeral effigies that can be found in Westminster Abbey. So um, funeral effigies uh, became popular for royalty and aristocrats in the later Middle Ages because funeral um, preparations were getting more elaborate and they were taking longer. So there was a reluctance to display the body at the funeral because um, putrefaction might have um, already set in by the time the funeral took place and could have resulted in some disturbing sights and uh, sound, smells, sorry. So uh, the um, um, custom grew up of uh, creating uh, funeral effigies of the deceased made from wax, wood and cloth, which could be displayed instead. So uh, many of these effigies ended up in uh, Westminster Abbey, where the funerals of a lot of uh, monarchs and members of royal families and aristocrats took place. And over the years, they, these effigies kind of built up into quite a collection in the Abbey. And uh, after some time, they began to decay a bit, their clothes began to get more kind of um, threadbare, and they became known as Westminster Abbey's Ragged Regiment. And um, after some time, they were kind of all gathered together and stored in an 11th century undercroft, a dimly lit Gothic um, undercroft in the Abbey. So that must have been quite a uh, an eerie sight, all these effigies in this dim undercroft in various states of decay. In recent years, however, um, there's been an attempt to uh, restore the effigies. So they've been taken out of the undercroft, uh, the effigies and their clothing have been restored, and they're now displayed in um, the Queen's uh, Diamond Jubilee Galleries, which can be found above the floor of Westminster Abbey in a well-lit but still rather Gothic space. So the effigies are in various um, states of um, um, preservation, uh, depending largely on their age. So, for example, the original effigy of Elizabeth I is merely a headless wooden mannequin um, uh, clothed um, only in underwear. And Elizabeth's effigy was actually remade uh, in the 18th century because it had fallen into such a, a state of disrepair. The effigy of Henry VII um, only has his head and um, arms and shoulders. The rest of him was destroyed by World War II bomb, but the face of the effigy is um, eerily characterful. Uh, another effigy is that of um, um, William III. Uh, by this point, um, the effigies are getting a bit more elaborate, a bit more sumptuously dressed, and uh, William's dressed in a, a very kind of luxuriant uh, fur-trimmed uh, robe. Um, this effigy here is, is also an interesting one. This is of uh, Francis Stuart, who was the Duchess of Richmond and Lennox, who died in 1702. So Francis Stuart was a well-known figure at the court of the Restoration. And um, as we can see from the, the, the effigy, she, she was obviously a very kind of um, fashionable, uh, beautiful woman. We can see how well she's dressed in her jewellery. 
And uh, Frances was especially famous because she refused to become the mistress of King Charles II, which wasn't something that many women refused um, in those days. Maybe the most um, poignant effigy in Westminster Abbey is this one. So this is the effigy of um, Robert, the Marquess of, of Normanby. And Robert died at only three years of age. And his effigy stands at just um, three feet, three inches tall. So Robert's uh, mother was Catherine, the Duchess of Buckingham. And uh, she was an illegitimate daughter of James II. And she was a very fashionable society woman. So she made sure the, the effigy of her son was very well dressed. Uh, he's wearing a, a long um, velvet robe lined with, um, fringed with silver braid. And um, he's wearing an ornate cap and a, a wig of real hair. Robert's face is um, eerily realistic. And uh, it seems that uh, his face was modeled on his uh, death mask. And in the back of this uh, velvet robe he's wearing can be found slits and those slits are where Robert's toddler's reins would have, would have fitted. Um, Catherine herself, um, she had her own effigy made uh, eight years before she died in 1743. And uh, this uh, effigy was uh, fashionably dressed in clothes uh, she'd selected herself. It had a, a wig of real human hair and it even had real uh, human eyelashes. And um, Catherine's uh, effigy was uh, the last of Westminster effigies to be taken to the Abbey in, um, in a funeral procession. It was drawn um, by uh, six um, horses um, draped in black velvet. So it was obviously a very kind of uh, uh, extravagant uh, affair. So um, I, I included these um, effigies because uh, even though as far as I know, there's no uh, ghost stories attached to them. I think they're just so kind of eerie and sort of spooky and uh, strange that I, um, I couldn't um, resist including them in this, uh, this Halloween presentation. Okay, so um, that, uh, that brings me to uh, the end of today's presentation. So I'd like to thank you all very much for coming today and uh, thank you all very much for listening. Uh, again, um, all these stories are from my book, uh, Church Curiosity, Strange Objects and Bizarre Legends. And the book's full of many, many more uh, strange stories and weird and, uh, and spooky artifacts. So if you liked the topics of today's talk, you'd probably uh, enjoy the book. So I'd just like to say happy Halloween to everybody. And uh, I'd be more than delighted to take any of your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, David. As everyone can see, I've just been attacked by the black shucks of North <laughs> London here. Um, <laughs> But thank you so much, David, and everyone, thank you um, for um, your questions, your comments. They've been really interesting to read. So everyone, we're going into question time now. Um, so this is your chance to ask um, any questions you have for David um, below. So please do um, comment away with your questions. Um, as David just said there, um, you can buy his book. So we're saying it today. So you can buy this through our website. I will quickly put a link on very shortly. Um, but you can buy it through our website for just eight pounds plus postage and packaging. Um, as I said, I've only got in stock um, this week about four. However, I should be taking a delivery um, of new books either tomorrow or next week. Um, so we will be shipping these out in the next couple of weeks, but we will keep you posted. But if you'd like to um, order them from us, um, we're most grateful because all of the um, profits from selling these books goes directly to Health and Health Care and Conserve Historic Churches. Um, finally, um, if all of those again at the start of our lecture, um, if you want to become a member of the trust, and as I said, membership starts from just £3.50 a month. If you um, join by direct debit and use the offer code lecture, and that's the word lecture in capitals, you will get a free copy of this book, which is The Secret Language of Churches Cathedrals by Dr. Rich Shep, And it's a fantastic book. If you've already got your copy, please do tell everyone um, what you think of it. Um, but let's go into question time. Um, so I'm going to dump dump jump straight in um for, with the first question so Ari Whalen Smithy um does anybody actually know anybody or even have a friend of a friend of a friend who left their horse at Whalen Smithy and came back to find the horse re reshod um I've I've no idea actually um if um anyone's actually tried it I, I guess people must have tried it over the years um it might be an interesting one if anyone lives near Wayland Smithy, take your horse there, see if uh, see if it gets reshod. 
Um, I mean, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I suspect this legend um, probably came from uh, Saxon settlers. Uh, they probably discovered the remains of this uh, Neolithic barrow and were, you know, like I was saying in the lecture, intrigued by it, tried to find an explanation for it and decided it was a, a haunt of their smith god, uh, Wayland. That's what, uh, that's what I suspect anyway. Thanks, David. And um, uh, the next one is, uh, there were a couple of comments that came in um, quickly about um, tunnels. Um, yeah, I'm happy to look at getting a lecture sorted out for you all about tunnels um, and something about Barrison Edmonds. Yes, Barrison Edmonds has some really interesting ones, but it's mm -hmm. mainly due to the fact that under the town there were chalk, uh, chalk lines and there's all pits. So um, parts of the town, mm -hmm. actually, even in the 80s and 90s, um, buildings suddenly collapsed. Um, there were sinkholes and whatnot. But the best thing to see in Bury is if you go into the Great Abbey great Graveyard and go to the old charnel house. And um, if you speak to the council, um, I've been there and they've opened it up and I've looked in before and there are it's effectively an ossuary um which is up below um it used to be a pub and then it became a candy shop shop afterwards mm. um but it's a great um thing to go and see if you're in Bury. um but i'll do my best everyone to try and get a lecture for you on tunnels and churches so on with the questions um have you ever seen or heard a ghost or something otherworldly when you've been doing your research um no to be honest um i i can't claim that i've i've ever seen a, a ghost um, I, I, I'm not even sure to what extent I, I believe in ghosts, although I think it's a really interesting kind of sociological and psychological phenomenon. Um, probably the most I've felt is perhaps slightly strange atmospheres sometimes. You know, if you go into a, a certain place, you, you can like pick up on a certain atmosphere. It's a little bit like electricity in the air, maybe a bit of an eerie, spooky feeling, which um, I feel sometimes in you know, old churches or old pubs or places like that. But that's about as far as it goes. I, I can't claim I've, I've ever seen a ghost to myself. Sorry to, to disappoint people. Thanks, David. And I know I appreciate your honesty there. And uh, yeah. I think this next question, it's it's a it's an interesting question. And it's actually, mm. I think it's really open to open for debate. And I think there's an element of um, you, uh, responsibility attached with this. But um, these legends may well attract people to visit a particular church, finding mm. fine in its way, and I find these legends fun. But how should churches encourage, um, how much should churches encourage um, these legends? Um, might they adversely affect people who are susceptible su to suggestion? Um, possibly, I suppose. Um, um, yeah, I'm not, not really sure how to answer that one. Um, I, I mean, obviously, if you're going to any historic site, church or anywhere else, you should be respectful. You should behave yourself and not vandalise anything or whatever. Um, I, I'd urge everybody to obviously respect our heritage. Um, but as, as for suggestions, I, I, I don't know, because, I mean, a lot of this stuff, it's just in the folklore. These legends exist. I guess local people hear about them, whether they're susceptible or not. And... Um, uh, yeah, you know, the, these legends were associated with these historic buildings and um, it's kind of, I guess, just a kind of folkloric thing. So I, I guess there's not much we can do about it, really. But uh, but obviously, any, anyone going to a, a historic site should should treat it with respect. Yeah. Thanks, David. I, and yeah. I'll just echo what you said there. And that's something yeah. we obviously encourage at the Stewart's Conservation Trust because mm. we don't allow um, our, our, our sites and paranormal investigation or anything like yeah. that. We, we don't permit. But these things, um, and as you said, it's folklore. These are part of our heritage. They are part of our mm. histories. And it is important that we document them. It is important that they're um, academically, like you've done, you've academically researched the topic. Um, so I think it's quite um, uh, quite important that we do talk about them. Mm. Um, someone said here um, a question about, um, could the dogs have actually been wolves? Um, well, um... It might go back to wolves. Um, I mean, these legends, they do specifically state they're, they're dogs, not wolves. Um, but um, there's been some, um, I, I didn't mention this in the lecture, but some people think there are like mythological connections between the black dog legends and dogs and wolves from mythology. So for example, um, the dog, which is meant to uh, guard the gates of Hades in Greek myth, um, Cerberus, I think it's called. Uh, I think it's a two-headed dog or something, three-headed dog. Um, so uh, again, that's a dog kind of guarding the boundary between the, the world of the living and the world of the dead. 
there's a similar dog that, that guards the uh, the underworld in Norse mythology. Also in Norse mythology, there's like the cosmic wolf, um, uh, Fenrir, I think it's called, which is meant to um, appear at the end of time and cause all kinds of terrible damage. Um, and uh, some people have linked black dog legends to that sort of Norse and cosmic wolf as well. So I think um, the black dog legends may, may, may come from uh, kind of older mythology of, of uh, dogs and, and wolves. It's, uh, it's quite possible, yes. Thank you. Thank you for that answer, there, David. And I, someone's um, uh, there have been quite a few um, interesting things connected with the black dogs. So thank you for that. Mm. And um, I, quickly, someone did uh, say, um, did um, comment some, um, are any of these things actually recorded? Um, particularly with the case at Blythborough and Bungie, it made national tabloids and it's very much recorded um, mm. in the press. But um, someone's asked, are there any instances where the black dog or a dog um, actually wasn't um, a demonic force, but actually was a force for good. And this links to the perennial question that do animals go to heaven? Yeah, so um, most most black dog legends, uh, the black dogs are sinister kind of threatening creatures, but there are some legends of uh, friendly and helpful black dogs, dogs which guide uh, travelers who are lost. Um, I think there's one from the Isle of Man. Um, a, a man was gonna go out on a fishing boat and he was walking towards the harbor. And this black dog appeared and kept blocking his path and just wouldn't let him pass. And he had to go home. And uh, later on, a, a terrible storm blew up, which uh, drowned a lot of fishermen. So um, there are stories of friendly black dogs. Um, some people think they might have arisen more in Victorian times. Uh, it could have possibly been a bit of Victorian sentimentality, kind of creeping into the black dog legend and sort of softening it and saying there are good black dogs as well as terrifying ones. Um, but, you know, the, these black dogs, they are kind of like um, liminal, kind of non-determinate creatures, you know, they straddle the worlds of life and death, so perhaps they could also be, you know, capable of good and bad behaviour as well. As for animals going to heaven, I, I don't know, I'm not a theologian, um, but uh, um, I mean, I guess anyone who'd had a pet would hope so. <laughs> yeah, uh, and it, yeah. It, I, the, the whole thing about the theology is that I, I won't yeah. bore everyone with a lecture about it, but the whole idea comes to about souls and do animals have souls. Mm. Um, mm. I, I'm quite pleased that Pope Francis um, a, a couple of years ago did say that animals do go to heaven. They are created okay. in God's, uh, by God mm. and um, that they mm. will join us in heaven. But mm. um, there's a distinction between um, human souls and animal souls. But mm. um, I was quite pleased that His Holiness did say that animals do go to heaven. Um, I'm going to plough on because there's quite a few questions mm -hmm. tr trickling in here, but um, could a DNA test perhaps be done on that mummified heart? Might its owner's identity be revealed? Um, and thank you for this interesting lecture. Well, yeah, thanks for listening. Um, it would be a really interesting idea to do a DNA test on it, um, something I hadn't thought of, to be honest. Um, the heart is apparently very fragile. Uh, when it got discovered, uh, it, it was already beginning to decay. Uh, just hours after its discovery. So the, the vicar of the church at the time made sure it was uh, placed back in its recess and uh, sealed up behind a, a window to preserve it. And you can still see it in the church today. Um, it's still in its recess in the pillar. It's quite high up, but if you had like a selfie stick or something, you could probably take a photo of it. Um, so I guess any DNA test would have to be very careful because of the, the condition of the heart. Uh, wouldn't want it to kind of crumble to dust but yeah it would be a fascinating idea you know do a DNA test on the, the heart um, maybe do a DNA test on the bones of some of the, the candidates and see if there's a match yeah. Thanks David and um, do you think that some of these stories such as um, the drummer boy and the black dog may be used by smugglers to keep people away from specific um, places such as navigable rivers? Hmm interesting point um, could well be uh, I would say that um, the, the Richmond drummer boy, the River Swale isn't navigable at that point. It's much too fast flowing. So you wouldn't get any smuggling boats up, up that particular river. But uh, yeah, it could, could well, there could well be a case for certain tunnels um, having legends uh, made up for them to, to um, keep them kind of safe for smugglers. Could be the case, yeah. And I, 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 I'm just going to quickly comment this one. Someone asked a quick question about when someone says in the words in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, um, where does it originate from? 
um, and what period it's come through. It's actually um, a, an incredibly ancient um, mm. form of Christian um, devotion. Um, it's um, Jesus himself um, in the liturgy of baptism. Um, you you baptize, you know, we used to, they're told, you know, go forth, baptize mm. in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. It's an incredibly ancient, it goes back to the earliest days of Christianity, um, but it's not in any way linked to um, dead people. It mm. is about mm. the, the, it is, um, um, in some way, it's invoking the Holy Trinity. Um, so mm. God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. Um, so um, more questions <laughs> coming in. Um, could the heart possibly have been mis uh, a misplaced religious relic of a saint or something similar, do you think? Um, I guess it's possible. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, maybe, maybe, I mean, with the Reformation, possibly, maybe someone wanted to hide a relic. Uh, that's a possibility I haven't heard or, or thought of, but I, I guess it could be the case, yeah. yeah. And uh, for yeah. those of you, um, I used to work at Ely Cathedral, and um, uh, you've got the beautiful cathedral uh, next to the Bishop's Palace. And if you go a couple of streets along, there's the Roman Catholic Chapel of St. Ethelreda. And if you go in there, they've got this lovely, at the end, a lovely glass dome. And inside of it, it has got the withered, the, what claims to be the withered mm. hand of St. Ethelreda. And it's sort of upright like this, and you can just see a hand. Um, oh, we okay. did, uh, I remember they put mm. a new altar in under the octagon, and um, the dean um, asked the Bishop of East Anglia if we could have a little sliver of bone to put in the altar. Um, sadly, we weren't allowed to do that. But um, it's quite interesting still, if you go around certain places, there are these um, mm. relics around that you can still go and people do, um, faithful Christians still do go and venerate these relics and mm. um, seek the invoc invocation of the saints. Um, I'm really excited um, because next week we've got a great lecture, everyone, and I will tell you about that very shortly. But um, um, I think another question we've got to ask, um, do you have a favorite um, church um, curiosity that is in some way linked with today's um, spooky theme, David? Um, I think my, possibly my favourite one, there's, there's a, I didn't mention it in today's lecture, but there's a church in uh, Surrey in, um, oh, what's it called? Um, it, it, the name of the place will come to me, but uh, there's a church in Surrey which contains a, a cauldron and uh, Frensham, that's it, Frensham Church in Surrey. It's supposed to be a witch's cauldron. And uh, there's a legend that, um, that the devil actually stole this cauldron from a white witch and the witch chased after him on a broomstick. And the devil made three huge leaps as the witch chased him, which uh, the, the dirt he kicked up when he landed formed uh, three local hills. And eventually the, the witch caught the devil, got the cauldron back, put it in the church for safekeeping. There's another legend that says the cauldron belonged to some fairies and um, they, they lent it to a, a man who didn't give it back in time. So they cursed him to be chased by this cauldron. So the cauldron sprouted legs and followed him everywhere and eventually followed him into the church uh, where he collapsed and died. Um, but this, this cauldron is actually uh, a medieval artifact and it would have been used to make um, beer in the, in the Middle Ages. So beer for kind of church festivities and weddings and things like this. So that's, that's maybe my, my favourite um, church artifact and it's it's mentioned in the book thanks david and uh, i've seen there's been more um comments coming for where you can find um human remains on exhibition churches and someone's quite uh, uh rightly pointed out that in sudbury at saint peter uh, uh i don't think it is is it saint peter's yes um it's not saint peter's sudbury it's in the other church which i think i want saint to say gregory's, oh, is it? gregory's that yeah. i think i think it is saint gregory's yes and um you go in and again, it's at the east end in um, a little chapel. There's a little cupboard in the wall and you can go in and you open up the door um, and there is the mummified head of Simon of Sudbury. Now, originally from Sudbury, he rose to be Archbishop of Canterbury. Um, he, um, and during um, a re peasant's revolt, um, he was um, locked himself up in the tower and uh, somehow um, the mob were let into the tower and um, they managed to lynch uh, and grab basically the Archbishop and um, beheaded him. Um, so it's quite a grisly story, but his head can still be seen yeah. um, in the church. And it, again, it's a, a really interesting part of history and it's something you wouldn't yeah. expect to see in a church. Yeah, yeah, that, that one's in my book as well. <laughs> so yeah. um, everyone, thank you so much again for your questions, everyone. Thank you, um, David, for doing today's lecture. Yeah, as, um, as we said, you can buy David's book from us today, eight pounds plus post packaging, all proceeds go to um, helping us care for historic churches at the trust. And I've seen there were a couple of comments about how do you claim your um, free book? Um, so the book in question you can get for free is this one. Um, and it's if you join as a member, it's from £3.50 um, by direct debit. 
So if you go on our website, I'll put a membership link. But if you join as a member from £3.50, select direct debits. When you go to checkout, there's an offer code area. So in the offer code, just type in lecture and that will um, make sure that you get your free copy of the book. If you have any problems though, just send us a direct message or send us an email. You can email me at digital at the cct.org.uk. Um, as I said, or just send us a direct message. Um, someone's saying hello, everyone. Um, but everyone, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I hope you've enjoyed this lecture. As I said, there's a really great, um, we've got two more um, really fascinating October lectures lined up for you. And that starts um, with next week's one, which where we're going to be joined by Dr. Emma Wells. Now, today we've touched on it a little bit, um, talking about some of um, holy relics that you can find in churches. And Dr. Emma Wells is going to be exploring that a bit more next week. Um, and it's not going to be in a sensationalist way. It's not going to be in any way um, demeaning to the genuine faith of countless millions of people around the world, or indeed of uh, medieval Christians. Um, but we're going to be looking at um, the gory and gruesome history of medieval cults and relics with a specific focus on the black market because in the middle ages there was a um, huge demand for relics and there are some really interesting historic accounts that survive um, and indeed some uh, historical relics that still survive um, where they were fake and uh, the lengths people went to to get hold of these relics um, so we're going to be talking about that next week the week after we're going to be rejoined by folklorist and historian dr francis young um, who's going to be talking to us about the history of exorcism in england and for that uh, week we've got a really interesting church of the week um because we've got a church which is built right next to an exorcist's house um so um do join us for those following um lectures i am busy um making sure that we've got details of the november lectures coming on soon so keep your eyes peeled for that um you can find details everyone if you join us for the first time about our upcoming lectures if you go on our main facebook page and if you click on events they're all on there but also if you go onto our website, which is www.visitchurches.org.uk, and if you click on, on what's on, you can see our upcoming lectures there, as well as our upcoming member lectures. So if you're a member with us, as I said, you get um, invita invited to um, our new series of exclusive member lectures. Thank you for everyone's um, comments today. Um, please do keep them coming if you're watching on Catch Up. Um, if you've got any ideas though for future lunchtime lectures, please do make sure you comment away because as I said, I am busy planning um, next year's series and um, I've been really grateful because some of the recommendations and suggestions made, I've been able to book um, following um, people's um, suggestions. So one of them is um, I've got a very early next year, a lecture booked in on angel rubes um, that you'll be pleased to hear about. So um, everyone keep your suggestions coming, keep your comments coming, but thank you so much everyone. Have a great week and um, we look forward to seeing you at another uh, Thursday lunchtime lecture. Take care, everybody.